Oh, and going interview. to get somebody that. Yeah. Well, I think what happened because he was talking to her. She was on the phone. I think the Herb Trump was actually on another call. Well, good afternoon, oh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tuesday, February 16th, 2016 uh, City Council work session. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. Uh, I will mention that uh, uh, when it comes time for the GLE to be on our City Council meeting, at that particular time, I will open it up for a public hearing. Uh, during this particular one, this is a, a work session for the Council to get all information. We're not going to be asking for input from outside of uh, anybody but the Glacial Lakes area. So just wanted to get that clear and out there. So the first thing that we want to do is discussion on terms and assurances regarding the vacation of South Broadway. This is uh, something that the council here as a work session council has seen, <coughs> what, two, three times, I think? And it recently went through the planning commission and, and they came up with some suggestions. So I thought it would be important that uh, we get a handle on what's going on and, and where we're at on that. So Jim, if you want to come on up to the, to the podium, uh, just kind of give us a little idea of what, what you're seeing and, and what you're hearing out there. And that'd be great. And guys um, and gals, I, I think that at any time, just throw those questions out to Jim. There's been a lot of questions out there on, on the South Broadway closure. So. We'll kind of go from there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, my name is Jim Sire. I'm CEO at Glacial Lakes Energy. Uh, we're we're going to start uh, here just by kind of, we're going to, I don't think it's uh, uh, necessary that we, we kind of regurgitate the reason for the loop track project, but we do have a slide or two in here about it, so uh, <coughs> certainly welcome our, uh, to your questions. We always want to answer questions, so uh, I'm just going to kind of run through here. I got about 20 some slides, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll open it up, or you can ask me as we go too. It doesn't matter. So here's here's the uh, a, a kind of an updated visual of of uh, schematic of of uh, of the project, and I just want to point out a few things. Of course, the top of the map is north. If you work your way along the top here, you see 212. If you come down here, you can see the bypass. The pink line here is the existing uh, service to Glacial Lakes Energy. <coughs> We're down in the corner. You can actually see just a part of our corn pile here, that white structure or that white circle. So anything in red uh, would be new rail. The, this solid green is the waterway through the, the property. And of course, here's uh, Broadway as you work your way up. Here's Hesco, here's Little River City, Max, and Napa uh, at the intersection of Broadway and 212. This, uh, this is the Hanton Farm. Uh, this is a, a proposed uh, tank farm and loadout facility that we would utilize uh, as a part of this project. And um, let's see, uh, this dotted line going through the property is a flood way and uh, we've got somebody from Austin here that can answer some questions more more related to that if necessary these uh, red circles are wetland mitigation where we would need to create wetlands um, and of course I'm sure this would be a uh, considered a wetland as well um, hmm. I think Jim uh, uh, if you may that green one now that's that's the direction that the water would travel is it not we would because create, you that. yes, there was some concern over, uh, you know, would this project back the floodwaters into the city of Watertown in a high water event? So we, we designed the project with a uh, box culverts right here on the north end. So when that water rises, it would come through here and it would, this is about a five to six foot uh, swale, if you will and it would make its way, and this is the lowest part of the pro uh, property, so it would make its way over here and out the box culverts on this side, on the east side here. And then you can see these are existing box culverts in our, under our, we'd have to create kind of a, uh, a waterway going over here and allowing it to make its way back to the river, more or less from overflow waters in this area. 
Jim, ask that farm site, how, how would they have access to and from that farm site? The uh, farm site, we've purchased the entire property, and, and uh, so there would be no access other than our own private access to that farm site. So any questions on this, this uh, schematic? With that, I'll move ahead and make a few comments, and I've got another one of these at the end so we can come back to it. You know, there's been some questions out there and, and uh, you know, on radio stations, in the news and whatever, you know, what, what's really the difference? And I wanted just to spend a moment on this to point out the difference. A, a unit train is a 96-car shipment originating from Watertown, which is destined for one unload facility. Um, Whereas right now we're shipping single cars which originate here and then they're destined for multiple locations. And as you can kind of think through that, if you can send 96 cars to one location and right now we hit uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, we hit Houston, we hit uh, Seattle, Tacoma and some other points. Uh, whereas single cars might, uh, surprisingly Denver does not have a unit train facility but we may end up sending single cars to Denver, Albuquerque, um, you know, points like that, San Diego, uh, they, they, you know, they go to those multiple locations, of course it takes extra time for them to come back and so that causes us to lease more cars to, to maintain our production levels. Typically uh, unit trains are, are uh, reserved for large quantities of a homogeneous product. I think the best example I can remember even growing up and spending time in Aberdeen was the coal trains that used to come through there and they would come from the west and of course we all knew they were headed for uh, the big stone plant but that was the first example I ever saw as a, as a child or a young young man of, of a coal train or a unit train and they stretch as far as you can see you know about 90 100 cars the grain is rapidly moving this direction and, and uh, I think out in our mina plant uh, uh, area we've in the last seven or eight years we've seen probably six or seven unit train facilities pop up. Grain is shipped from that area to all points, uh, including for export, um, out of that area uh, with unit trains. Unit trains are more timely and efficient for the producer, which is Glacial Lakes Energy, the shipper, which is the BNSF, and the end customer, which could be somebody like, uh, well, it could be a, for an export destination or, or multiple end customers. Uh, in a letter to the uh, the mayor a while back, the uh, the uh, the VP of Ag Products from the BNSF uh, had this to say: This project could potentially aid in reducing overall grade crossing times over the course of a day because unit train service may result in fewer trains, less overall train time at at grade crossings can benefit commuters and other surface traffic. And I've got some statistics on that. Uh, I think I was asked to provide some information. I've got some more statistics coming up. The Loop Track project is all about efficiency and market access for GLE, but uh, in our, our uh, view, everybody comes away with wins here. Of course, GLE wins. We wouldn't be spending the $20 million if we didn't think there was something in here for us, um, improved efficiency, greater market opportunities, and needed infrastructure improvements. The BNSF wins uh, increased market share efficiencies of the unit train <coughs> service as, as, we, uh, as we know they, they want to continue to move that direction. In our view, the city wins. The BNSF service to this city is elevated to the next level. Uh, they are, they are uh, you know, if they're headed this direction, we want to provide as much cause for them to maintain the level of service that they currently provide. And in our view, rail service is very critical to the success, the economic success of this committee, and we're happy to be the majority of that uh, service. Glacial Lakes Energy's uh, increased long-term economic impact on the city. Uh, I've got some uh, statistics on that coming later. Yeah, Short-term economic activity from the construction project. We all love to see uh, large projects like this come our way as a part of... Uh, continued growth and economic development and I could only hope that we were sitting here next year and the year after and there's other businesses with a 20 million dollar project in front of, in front of this uh, council. 
A change in property tax assessment, we fully expect that this will lead to a, a change in, in that property that we purchased and of course with the improvements that we're going to put on it, we, we fully expect that there will be some, some additional property tax assessments. <coughs> Well, Jim, based on that, what you're <coughs> saying there is is that all this is going to be brought into the city. Am I correct? Uh, is, th that would be our assumption. Yes. But even even so, I mean, I my understanding of the, the the property taxes are that would make its way back to the county and to the school, and and so city residents would yeah. would well, benefit. You know, and I'm sure that we would prefer it to be annexed into the city. So I just I'm just throwing that. <coughs> out. I don't know that we would oppose any any effort to do that. And we feel there's a big win in this for the general public, uh, you know, and this is maybe the, the, the biggest area that uh, uh, outside of GLE, um, enhanced highway accessibility, fewer railroad crossing events, uh, trains keep moving, um, fewer idle tank tanker cars uptown. Uh, that was kind of brought to our attention by the fire department last meeting. Uh, quite frankly, we haven't even, weren't even aware of that, hadn't thought about it. We kind of made the assumption that you know, we're, we're used to being around loaded tanker cars, but not everybody else is. So, uh, you know, so if there's some concern out there about that, um, this, this would give us the capability to take those cars in our own possession and keep them out of the main heart of the city. So let's just talk about the improved safety and accessibility for a minute. Uh, the current situation as a single car shipper uh, and we've all been there. The staging of, on arrival and departure causes traffic backups on US 212. And, you know, this is, this is a classic. I think we've all had a front row seat to this where, you know, you're sitting there on 212 and you think, okay, here comes the end of the train. And then all of a sudden it starts to slow and it stops and then it goes the other way. Well, that, that's what they have to do as a single car shipper. They have to do this staging and swapping around and moving of cars and, and, uh, so, uh, you know, we know that, that uh, we're, all, we're all aware of what happens there. And again, uh, because of limited space, uh, we've got those extra tankers parked uptown when, when GLE tracks are full. We reached out to the BNSF crews, and uh, they, they uh, basically said in their estimation that there's an average of 8 to 10 crossing events per week here in Watertown, across 212, okay? Or, and that equates to roughly 32 to 40 per month. And they're nearly always during peak traffic hours, right? I mean, you're, you're I'm going to run this quick errand at noon, and then you get caught there, and now you got to explain to others why you're late for meetings. And I define peak traffic hours as 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. here. So under unit train uh, operation, uh, first of all, there would be four loops or four tracks within the one loop. Um, and they each track is capable of holding an entire 96 car train. The train would arrive and it would come through and it would basically have minimal interruption, uh, if any, and just come in and uh, other than it, it taking time to clear the, uh, you know, the 96 cars to clear. It would enter our loop and, and kind of curl itself up in there. The engines would unhook un, uh, and, and uh, then it's, it's uh, on our property and available for us to, to uh, manage and fill and, and uh, stage for the next departure. On the departure, uh, I call it the hook and go departure concept. It eliminates this back and forth staging that occurs. The engines come in, they hook up to the 96 car string, they air up, they get ready, and they're out of there and they're gone. Now they're going to cross 212 again. Um, just doing some math, if, if they travel at about 10 miles per hour, and we have reason to believe that that's about what they travel at, they will clear 212 in, in about eight minutes. I don't know what it is now. Uh, I know that we would, uh, we would have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, probably some additional time at times. Sometimes maybe it's quicker than that, but uh, uh, again, that's, that's kind of our assumption of how this would work. Again, we would have minimal need to park extra tankers uptown, uh, and this would equate under a unit train facility, and this is actually based on the production out of Mina. So we have real live data to, to base this on. There are 12 cross, there would be 12 crossing events per month versus the 32 to 40 that we currently experience. 
Now the other thing is that we all need to keep in mind is these unit trains run at all hours of the day. And we've actually got time logs for the entire 2015 that show uh, when these trains come and go. So half of those are occurring during non-peak hours or some of them, in, in the case, some of them are in the middle of the night. And here we go, I mean, of our 80 ethanol units up in Mina, this is actual real live da data that we pulled. About 45 of those 80 were, were between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and 35 of, of them were, were uh, between uh, 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So almost a 50-50. Uh, certainly uh, as close as you can get without being there. Uh, DDG units, our distiller units would look about the same in terms of arrivals and departures. We didn't, we didn't gather that information. Once we saw this, we felt like this was, uh, and our crews up there are telling us that DDG units look and act the same way as an ethanol unit. So kind of moving into some of the other concerns we've heard about with this project, what about the flood concerns? Uh, we are designing this uh, project with a zero rise goal and designation is, is that that designation has been held intact so far. Uh, you saw the waterway through the middle of the property and it follows the lowest elevation. Um, you know, we may very well have a better capability to handle a high water event with this design than we currently do. Um, and then FEMA, uh, the FEMA consultant has approved our plan and now it's in front of FEMA for, for approval. What about the bridge? I mean, we've had uh, you know, some discussion early on about this bridge. Uh, we've, we've dug into that and we've, we've did some uh, fairly extensive uh, review of, of uh, the engineer's uh, recommendations. First, we had to understand why the bridge was being weight limited the way it was. And uh, after we, we saw, actually went under the bridge and saw some of the deterioration that's occurring, um, there's really the option that we would, we would uh, be willing to partake or include in the project is an option that would provide an estimated 30-year life for $400,000. Uh, we've added that into our project budget. Uh, it would eliminate the weight limits. It would replace the deck, it would replace the beams, beams that hold the deck and will allow HESCO uh, unlimited <laughs> or unrestricted service and access. Uh, the, only, uh, you know, the only thing we'd be looking for from the city going forward is the maintenance of that bridge. What about affected businesses? Uh, we're working with Little River City on a customer diversification plan. We've introduced uh, a blender pump program that the governor's office has in front of them or that has, has, they've been pitching. Um, we've been working with uh, folks over there to, to, uh, uh, to try to diversify their, their uh, customer base. Um, they have shared with us that they're uh, heavily dependent on uh, their casino. And uh, so we would like to try to uh, uh, maybe drive some other traffic in there that would, and if we can get them retrofitted with blender pumps uh, we think we can uh, drive our shareholders and our, our loyal uh, followers to that location. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to even handing out uh, uh, coupons good for cash purchases over at uh, Little River City to our employees, to Dakota Bodies employees, to people in the trailer court or whatever we need to do for a period of time to get people moving that direction. So we're very conscious of, of uh, their concerns and, and uh, I uh, hope that we can work with, uh, uh, provide a plan that they can, uh, uh, they can benefit from. We're working with HESCO on the egress. That was a concern of theirs uh, in the event of emergency. They're concerned that they don't have any way to get out other than over that bridge. Um, we will actually have a 13-foot wide access road all the way around that, that track. The only thing separating HESCO from that access road or from the general public from that access road would be a, a, a basically a, a gate on existing Broadway, so we'd have to give HESCO some access to that gate so they could open it and get out in the event of emergency. In my discussions with uh, Mr. Henrik, uh, he felt that that was uh, more than acceptable, and um, you know certainly not something we'd want to continue because of the you know you'd be driving right next to rail cars, and you know, of course. Uh, we don't want that to be a public road, but certainly uh, in a, in a short-term event, it would be uh, workable. 
Dakota bodies uh, really had no concerns over this. Um, you know, they've, uh, and, and again, we would, it, coming from their management, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of the employees might say, well, that was my way uh, up to get uh, whatever. If I want to run errands, uh, we would again make, uh, make sure that they had some access if they were, uh, as uh, Little River City has indicated, if, if, they, uh, if, if this is a part of their clientele, we would make sure that uh, we provide some um, benefit for them to continue that relationship. Now what about cutting off uptown? Uh, of course, you know what they say about opinions, everybody has one. Um, I don't see this, we don't see this as a concern. Uh, I pulled some uh, traffic on Broadway north of 212 uh, toward the uptown area, and it's been constant since the 20th Avenue bypass opened. It ranges from 3,700 in 2008 to 3,500 in 2014. Interestingly enough, there was a period in there where it peaked at 4,000 vehicles. I think, uh, of course, Shane is new to town. I, you know, I'm, I've been here those years, and I can't explain why Broadway north of 212 would have those fluctuations unless it was seasonal or maybe some other road was closed, but uh, um, that those are the numbers. Uh, I, I think uh, people will continue to use Broadway to the north of 212. Um, I, in, in, in our opinion, the closure of Broadway south of 212 would have absolutely no effect on uh, people finding their way uptown. Jim, if I, if I may, I'd like to just jump in there. I actually, um, or I should say we did, we actually hired people to sit out there and count the cars that went from South Broadway across Highway 212. And on Saturday, from, from coming across from the south to across to the north, uh, throughout the day there were 67 cars. On Tuesday, now Saturday of course is kind of a shopping day and, and I would assume. Tuesday, the same, uh, same person sat out there and counted 56 cars. Just to give you an idea that, that what is crossing Highway 212 coming into town. So minimal impact on these 37, 3,500 numbers, really. Um, Jim, where I, did, and where, again, where are those numbers coming from? Where did you obtain those numbers? I re received those from the city engineer's office. Okay. So again, uh, South Dakota Highway 20 and US 81 still are the most viable ways to uptown from the 20th Avenue bypass, and I don't see that changing as part of this closure. Uh, there was a suggestion, well, maybe we can split the train. Uh, we have asked this very question, and I think we put it out in front of the council at the last November meeting. Um, and the, the, the answer that we're receiving from the railroad, it's not a practi practical or workable solution. And if you kind of put yourself, okay, so we did, let's assume we tried this. First of all, the BN is not agreeable to trying it, but let's assume they did. I can, I can assure you that based on what we're doing in, in Mina, we would be on those crossings for extended times on almost on a daily basis, maybe except for the weekends, causing, and I feel like it would cause more f frustration than the crossing at US-12. So. Once we're up there and it's unpredictable and we're there blocking that way, um, trying to move cars back and forth, uh, you know, traffic is just going to avoid that, that street altogether. So now, now you're back to, well, what's the purpose of the street? Uh, and, and certainly if, if we've got people in through Broadway and we've got parts of trains and we're moving, it creates an additional safety concerns for us. And uh, so I, I just don't see this as, as uh, something that, that is, is practical and workable. Jim, you may have answered this, this, this question here before, but, but explain the, the, the four loops. Not that it changes the overall, uh, what, we're, what we're addressing, but can you just give it a yeah, brief? Yeah, um, you know, we, we've kind of tossed this around in our minds too, Glenn, that, you know, do we need four loops? And, and uh, you know, of course, the BN is, is, is has to approve this project uh, and the design of this project and, and really the four loops are for, let's assume, and this happens in our mine of plant, let's assume we have a full ethanol unit ready to go and another one coming back. So you need two tracks just for that, two loops, two tracks in the loop just for that. Now take yourself over to the DDG side of our business. You got a full one there, almost full, and you got an empty one coming back. 
you need two more tracks for that too. And, and the 32 to 40 uh, crossing events per month, that includes the DDG uh, trains in too, or is that just the ethanol? Well, that's where we're at existing today, and that includes mixed products. Okay. When, they, when they come in now, they come in, they grab the full tankers, and they grab the full hopper cars, and these crossing events start to occur. In this particular situation, you're going to have them coming in or bringing in all tankers or all hopper cars, and unless there's some upset in Wilmer or some other point, I would not see a situation where they mix those. Okay, so what about the environmental impact? We've had a few questions out there about this. Um, we are talking with uh, the NRCS and the FSA office. Um, a question that I've posed for the mayor is would this be compatible with the city's wetland bank? I mean, we certainly would be open to leaving some space for that. Uh, I mean, we're down in a low area. I would think that this would be ideal for, for that kind of a, uh, compatible to that kind of a project. And it's very probable, if not uh, definite, that we will uh, convert the rest of that tilled ground in that loop to uh, CRP or some sort of conservation easement. And that's what I'm talking to the folks at the FSA about. Shane, can you uh, maybe step in there and, and just give us a, a little history again about uh, the wetland banks and how that works and if it would qualify for that? Well, wetland banks, um, if you have sporadic little or or smaller wetlands throughout the community that development's going to overtake. What you do is you consider having a wetland bank area that's within the watershed, but it's not located where those developments are happy, happening. And usually they are in the lower areas, like the area along Broadway down here. So um, we could easily bank up some wetlands, you know, several acres, so that way when uh, a different part of town needs to encroach on wetlands, we have available space to just easily. So, so are you saying that if we got some spot up north here on a, on a development, we could fill that wetland in, use this that you've banked over here, is that correct? Typically that's okay. allowable, yes. Or, or come into our loop and create the wetland. Again, the project timeline is, is uh, fairly quickly here. I mean, we, we, uh, our intent is to move dirt this spring with a fall uh, 2016 completion. Uh, you know, there's some, some contingencies here. Of course, the FEMA approval, the BNSF approval, approval to close Broadway. Um, and then, uh, you know, this bridge, uh, we need to make sure that that gets replaced. And the, the option I think we put in front, front of the, the uh, engineer's office was uh, you know, roughly a 45 to 60 day project, uh, we would need to have that bridge replaced before uh, we could close off HESCO from the south. In that time being, you could be working on construction of your own. We would be in the back part of the property, yeah. more than likely building the, uh, the deck or, or the, the berm for the rail track, yes. Just some, uh, I want you know, this is something that uh, I think we all like to see when we, you know, I, I sit on the board of the Watertown Development Corp and uh, when, when they're, you know, our mission is to take care and, and uh, provide a, a favorable business environment for existing businesses as well as new business. Well, GLE is an existing business since uh, the early part of the, the uh, century, 2001 or two is when it was founded. Uh, we employ 120 with an average of uh, 50,000 plus per year. The annual taxes, sales and property taxes are over four million. Um, and of course, any, any reinvestment of this nature would add to the property tax base and, and boost those, uh, those tax numbers up. But there's something different about GLE as well, and that's uh, the profits that are distributed back to the shareholders, the local owners of this company. Uh, that's why we're in business, is to take this product, this corn that's grown in the area, add value to it, and then give it back. If we simply put this on a, a train and shipped it out so that somebody else could add value to it, we would lose this opportunity to uh, retain this, this wealth in the area. 93.6 million in the past two years. Um, you might want to remember that number. Our, our margins are way down this year. 
Um, but the uh, last two years have been very, very good to GLE and, and consequently to this community too. Um, we've, uh, we've estimated that about 55 to 60 percent of our shareholders live in the Coddington County or the contiguous counties that feed into the Watertown area as a, as a, uh, and do their shopping. We see these license plates every weekend and during the week. Um, so, you know, 55% of that or maybe even 60% of that number stays in town and it's, it's re regenerated through the, uh, through the community. And, of course, our hope is that it generates sales tax revenues. How important is value-added agriculture to Watertown? I think a re recent sales tax collection trends kind of tell us that story. Um, when agriculture does well, everyone benefits, including those of us that live in the city. These guys uh, come in, they buy equipment, they buy uh, vehicles, they, they spend that money. And uh, so um, um, everyone benefits. And, and we are a value-added agricultural uh, business. Here's the uh, loop again, and uh, I guess with that, if we have any other questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. I just wanted to mention on that slide previous to that, when you, when you talk about uh, when agriculture does well, when you go out to the farm show this last week, they were, it was just buzzing with people, you know, talking about the new tractors and new things like that. Uh, when they do well, Watertown does well. We, we depend upon that. Jim, the, the, the so-called tank farm or whatever you're going to call it to, that you would use to fill cars with? Yes. Is that fed by a pipeline from the main plant then? or It would be, Randy, it would be fed by a pipeline that kind of follows generally this direction. It will, you know, it will follow our rail and go back to, down to, a, you know, a, a, I suppose a point in the plant where, in a current tank farm where, yes, yeah. it'd be How above ground tank. Okay. How would above you? Above ground um, uh, pipe. How would you feed the uh, distiller's grain to that point? We would uh, we would be loading the distillers. That that's a that's a great question and, and a difficult one. We it's not practical and, and just feasible to build a you know a facility out here and then try to convey distillers grains. We would fill those cars back here and then push them out into the loop and, and then construct our train out there. You know, if you could envision us pushing five cars out there, grabbing five empties, bringing them back in, and kind of that process would, would keep repeating itself. I, I didn't see the number uh, in your slides, Jim, but uh, the, the South Broadway traffic usage has decreased considerably uh, in recent years down to, what, something like 1,100 uh, vehicles per day. I don't know if you would know this or Shane, how was that 1100 arrived? Is that, uh, in other words, if, if one car goes both directions, is that count as two or is, are we only counting one side of the, uh, the, the road? If they take the same path to and from town, they're counted twice. So oh. roughly the, the, le the le last time a counter was put out there, it generated just over 1100 vehicles. Um, again, there are so many variables to which day of the week or which week of the month, all of those things can impact those numbers. Obviously, that seems a little bit high compared to what our observer that sat out there does uh, or has counted. I mean, certainly we had probably more than the 50 or 60 cars in the whole day, but in the time frame that they're there, that's a pretty low count. I, Just to be so. Clear that 60 cars is cars that went straight across 212, not took lefts or right. Correct. Yeah. So, okay. Shane, when you, when you made that count, was that prior to the bypass construction or? The, the 1,100 yeah. number was after. After. Yeah. Thanks. My understanding, the number, uh, Mr. Bueller, before the bypass was uh, three times that. That's correct. People that live in that area, has anybody asked them anything about this? Is this an issue for them, <laughs> or do they take the bypass, and now with 81 going to get that roundabout, will that take care of the people that live? There are quite a few people that live down there. I don't know where they, I really don't know where, if they use that new road, or if they try to get on 81, or what does happen. Well, I, I would have to assume that since the, the drop in the, 
the Broadway traffic drop to a third that they're using the bypass. Um, I mean, going from 3,300 to 1,100 would seem to me that they're finding ways to get east or west other than going up Broadway. Uh, Dan, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm still uh, kind of, uh, it, it's an open question how that, that roundabout's going to work down there with all the truck traffic. And, I mean, we've talked to the state about that, and they claim that, you know, have no worries. This has been proven in other states, and they've run every model they know to run through there including the extra long doubles that we see. Uh, so, uh, you know, will, will those folks that live down there, will they adapt to that bypass or that uh, roundabout? I can tell you that uh, that corner does make me nervous um, every time I have to go through it. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, should I step her down and try to get through right here, or should I just wait another five minutes because there's cars coming from both directions? <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, I would think uh, the roundabout hopefully will improve that that trip. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, and maybe to answer your first question is we we have had some informal feedback from the the trailer court. We've not done a formal survey. We've not been over in there knocking on doors, but we've we've had some feedback, and you know, it's it's really doesn't seem to be of concern. And I was kind of hoping that if there would be some, I mean, I'm, we're here tonight. I'm going to be on What's Up tomorrow. Um, kind of hoping to hear some of it. But, uh, uh, and we may, uh, we may actually do something. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm, we may do something to uh, uh, inform or educate those folks uh, about the decision coming up in front of the council uh, just to, to make sure that they know what's coming. Say, Shane, when is the roundabout scheduled to go in over there? It's like 2018. 18. So this is, if everything goes through, Jim, this is going to be in place about a year and a half to two years in advance of the roundabout. And yes. so that's going to put more traffic to that corner than what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. um, those 1,100 cars got to go somewhere or, or whatever their number is, 500, 800, whatever it is. <clears throat> so that would be... Certainly, that's one cause of concern. That's a terrible corner. I, you know, I, I almost got killed there going down Lake Ponce uh, last summer. And so I know it's bad, and you guys are there all the time. So, um, you know, that, that almost two-year period with no fix for that corner probably is a concern, though. At least it's certainly a consideration. Well, I'm not a traffic engineer, but I think the first fix would be to lower the speed limit going through there. The city has made that request and has not gotten a positive response because they anticipate the speeds will go down with the construction of the roundabout. Everybody's going to have to slow down to negotiate that, so they're going to—they're kind of in a wait and see pattern. But I did make a request to reduce the speed limit. I actually have three questions, and you can order and answer them in whatever order you want. Um, now, I believe I recall that we've spoken with the fire department and the police department on response times if there were no, if we closed that access to Broadway. And then the last question I had, we were talking about economic impact, and I recall when the plant was first being built that there was a tremendous um, impact on the municipal utilities and how much utilities you used. And um, is that something that's going to continue to benefit the entire community? Their buying capacity stay big? Are you going to increase production? Do you understand where I'm going with that? Is that something that? <coughs> yes. Um, the feedback we've received, or at least uh, uh, I, actually I got an email today from uh, the assistant chief uh, wants us to consider supporting his, uh, his uh, uh, project out west of the airport there. I guess there's another phase coming up. And in the email, he did share that he is in full support of our project. Um, so I think we enjoy the support of police and fire. And if I remember right from a previous comment the mayor made is that there's no concerns on either, either department there. Um, as far as the economic impact, uh, the, the GLE's port, we're, we're about a fifth or 20% of the production in the state. And if you, 
the, the, the South Dakota Institute of Producers a while back did a study, and if you take the, the results of that study and you just say, well, for simplicity purposes, let's take a fifth of it, we're about a um, seven to eight hundred million dollar economic impact uh, in the state using the results of that study. Now, part of that is over at our mina plant, clearly, and the most of that is going to be in the way that corn is marketed in this area. You know, we've got a couple of board members that can remember the days when corn was 92 under, 92 cents under the Chicago Board of Trade price, and you know, we haven't seen those levels. We might see it for a week here or there during harvest when there's no place to go with this corn, but we haven't seen those levels for quite some time. So that's going to be the bulk of that impact uh, is for those corn farmers to get a better price for their corn, and that's what they had envisioned when they, they founded this plant. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, we, we uh, based on the stats that we've ran at the uh, state level, at the state association level, we, we proudly claim that, that 700 to 800 million impact, and primarily in northeastern South Dakota. Um, and then uh, to answer your question about the, uh, the utilities, um, we, have, we have purchased uh, natural gas directly from the market. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, we just signed an agreement with the uh, Watertown Municipal Utilities for the uh, throughput costs, and that forced our, our uh, costs up by almost $90,000 a year. So, um, you know, obviously we recognize the importance of having a good, strong utilities department. <coughs> we continue to support that, and um, you know they. We know that they bend over backwards to keep our service constant, and uh, we, you know, we, uh, as as managers of our company, you know, when you see a cost increase like that coming, you say, okay, well, you know, you can't get by without utility services, and so you sit down with them and you kind of reassure each other and make sure the relationships intact and I think we've done that and we've got very strong bond with those guys over there in utilities so I I I, I can't say I understand exactly the the part of the business that uh, you know do we benefit the city of Watertown I'd like to think so I think that uh, you know an increase of 90,000 in one year is is some evidence that that that's occurring. Well, it's huge, Jim, <coughs> when you take a look at, uh, you know, you, you have your throughput cost, but we also receive a tax on every everything that goes through. So that's how the city of Watertown is generating the dollars. Shelley, I, I don't know what the impact is uh, through the utilities, but I was thinking it was between two and 300,000 a year is what Glacial Lakes generates for the city of Watertown, just on, on the tax that comes through. And with the new throughput, you know, going into the utilities, uh, we, we will. St it'll truly benefit Watertown. Absolutely. Now you're thinking, making me think I didn't do a good enough job negotiating. <laughs> Ninety thousand dollar increase on two hundred thousand. <laughs> See, Jim, I got a question. How big when you have when you have a tank car full of ethanol? How many gallons in that? About thirty thousand. Yeah, just under thirty thousand. Okay. And and on a typical day or week, if I was to walk out into your property as well as the area north of Highway 212, where all those tracks are at. How many cars would you guys have there, both empty and full, on mm. average, about? You know, and it varies, Mike. I, I don't know. I mean, it varies. It's, it's based on how the cars move. I, I've noticed, uh, you know, I've noticed cars chalked in by Watertown Co-op there and over by, uh, well, by the, 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 uh, the salvage yard and, and uh, you know, kind of all over back in there, and then you go back the next week and they're all gone. So, you know, it kind of varies how they move, but uh, I believe our, our uh, ethanol fleet in Watertown is uh, roughly, uh, our tanker fleet for Watertown is roughly uh, 600 cars, five 600 cars, and we want to cut that in half. So, um, you know, we would have considerably less cars to deal with, and the reason we can do that is because these trains will move, will turn quicker. Right now our average is about 35 days when once we ship a car out and it comes back. Uh, with a unit train facility, it's about 16 to 17 days. And so you, you, you get better use of the cars. I also wanted to mention, you know, when we talked about the impact that you have on our natural gas, uh, one of the advantages that Watertown has with 
with you folks being out there, it lowers our cost of, of natural gas coming into Watertown because of the amounts that come through the line. So it is a benefit to Watertown, the citizens of Watertown, on the utility bills, keeping those, <coughs> excuse me, keeping those prices lower on our natural gas purchases. Well, I, I, I'd like to think of it as a two-way street, Mayor. I think uh, you know, we certainly benefit from uh, uh, having a more robust and, and uh, 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 state-of-the-art utilities department. Um, and uh, from that, the, the citizens benefit. Um, at the same time, the citizens benefit when, when there's somebody like us on the other end of the line, too. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I'd like to think it's a kind of a mutual uh, beneficiary, uh, beneficial agreement or situation. Jim, if you were to go back to emergency response time, you know, I think what a lot of people fail to do is look at the impact of the whole community. I mean, if, if you look at the impact of the whole community commu or, uh, response time, and if you're taking those trains off of Highway 212 and you're limiting that, that's going to increase the response time to the whole community a lot. I mean, it, I don't know how many times a, a police car or ambulance or fire truck has been stopped at a railroad crossing. So if you're going to eliminate that by a third or half, you're going to increase the response time or decrease the re response time in the whole community. Well, so. you're, Randy, you're going to decrease the at times the number of times that a, a res emergency vehicle will get hung up there. And really, again, it's it's we're going from 30 to 40 crossing events during the course of any given month to, uh, and that's per, in, per the BNSF estimate, to uh, really to six, because we're going to have 12 crossing events, but remember six of those or five of those are going to be at night. So now you can have emergency vehicles moving at all times of the night, but again, I don't know what what the, their stats would be as to when their, most of their calls are, but I'm going to guess that most of them are during the daylight hours. The, the other issue, and let's not, not forget, that the Highway 212 is not our only issue. We have a, your trains that go north have either four or five other intersections that they need to, to close. So, you know, those are our ability to respond as well. It depends on what direction we're trying to respond to. Well, Jim... Uh, I want to thank you for being here. I know that this went through the Planning Commission, if I'm not mistaken. Shane, how did that end up as? The Planning Commission recommended approval of the vacation. Okay. Uh, this will come in front of the Council on March the 7th as a, uh, uh, an open, a public hearing, I'm not mistaken. The public will be asked uh, if there's any, uh, anyone who speaks in favor of or against it, and that will happen on the 7th of March. So. Uh, if there are no more questions, thanks, Jim. I, I sure appreciate it. And Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, I had one that I wanted to bring up to you guys, and, and I just asked Spencer to put it up. As, as you know, we had some issues at, uh, at the clubhouse out at the golf course, and we kind of took some ideas and, and put it out in front of some of the contractors and what it would cost to, uh, to bring that up to, up to speed. What we did, and I think there's about eight pictures on there, different looks, different colors, what could happen. Uh, this is actually looking from kind of that, uh, what would you say, the north side, Mike? Looking south in the That's clubhouse. Main yeah, main interest off to the side. Thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Uh, same thing. This is just in gray. There's some darker ones, I think, that uh, that can be shown. The The current cost of doing this, uh, what we've gotten for bids back from four different contractors, is approximately $25,000 to redo the the clubhouse out there, put in the new drop ceiling, put in some lights, put in some, uh, uh, um, it's called a mini split into the, the cooking area so that you aren't losing all your, your air conditioning up through the ventilation that they're using in that. So uh, this is something that will go in front of the committee that we put together that works for the, you know, kind of a vision process out at the, call, at the golf course. 
So that group will, will get together. They're going to look at this and just kind of hash it over. It's currently under $25,000. There was something on the agenda tonight. I think you'll see it. Uh, it was a, a um, gosh, what is the machine called? It's a knife sharpener. Is that correct, Jay? Real sharp, real grinder. Yeah, the real grinder, more than likely you will look at it and reject those particular bids. Uh, uh, they say they don't, they don't need it anyhow this particular year. So uh, we'll probably have the council just take a look at that and change the dollars over in, in, a, uh, in a different area to use for this. So I would encourage uh, anybody who wants to talk about this at some time. Mike uh, is, is on that committee. Mike and Jay, and, and uh, there's a number of them on there. What is it, about five or six we got, Mike? Yep. Uh, just to look at the the uh, changing of the of the clubhouse a little bit, bring it up to speed, see if there's anything else needed out there, and just some visioning process. And, and uh, we're going to also have that group work with Jay and work with uh, Todd out there on what they have for capital improvement plans in the, in the future. So that's kind of where we're at. Any questions on this? It's kind of exciting. Do you suppose, do you suppose this uh, will help my golf game? <laughs> I would think so. A $30 million addition would not help your golf game. <laughs> Anybody got any questions on that, what the plan is, what's going on? Anybody else want to bring up anything else going on in town you want to talk about? Got a few minutes here. Steve, it was Yeah. Go ahead with your oh, it just I think John, this question's for you for the uh, event center. Uh curious when the fights the Fury fights are going to be out there, do you know? Just so you know that uh, uh, I know we talked to Jen out at uh, Impere. Uh, they're absolutely on top of this. You know, that's the attorney that works for the state of South Dakota. Uh, the person running these fights has uh, numerous things that they had to jump through to, to get it done and to get it approved. February 27th, Saturday. Okay. Okay, Dan, what do you got? Uh, the last time I talked to you, you were going to discuss the uh, the uh, hockey rink things, and I don't know if this is appropriate now to ask. I've been gone, so I didn't follow up on what you had heard or where we are with uh, hockey rinks. As a matter of fact, Shelly and I were at a meeting today, and, and uh, we had the opportunity to look at the new rinks and the two rinks on it, how many seating. You know, it's over 2,000 seats in it. Uh, two rinks, it's, it's extremely nice. It looks, it looks very, very nice. We're just trying to make sure that uh, the dollars are there and everything is squared away for it. So no timeline? No timeline yet, or maybe a timeline? No, no, time, no timeline as of yet, yeah. Anybody see they were out there burying uh, light poles out at the new softball field? It looks like they got all of them in, so... I didn't see that. <laughs> you got to get out of your office more I often. Think so. so, yeah. So. Either that or it's too close to my office, one or the other. So, anything else? Okay. At this time, I will adjourn this meeting, and we'll be back at seven o'clock for the. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tuesday, February 16th, 2016 City Council meeting. At this time, I will call the meeting to order, and we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. Shelly, you want to do roll call for us? I can. Albertson? Here. Bueller? <coughs> Bueller. Here. <coughs> Danforth? Here. Manti? Here. Riefenberger absent. Roby is absent. Solom? Here. Thorson? Here. Tupper? Here. Billhauer? Here. Thank you. Okay, at this time I'll look for a motion a second for discussion on approval of the consent agenda. 
Motion by Beth, second by Glenn. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number two, I will need the approval of the agenda, but I would like to add under 13A to uh, add a signature, signature for an easement for a permitted approach. Or uh, tell me what you want then. I thought that's it, what you were asking. It's a, ten, it's a, it. it's a, a permanent, encro it's an encroachment agreement. Encro Oh, that's right. I got an easement. I'm sorry, encroachment agreement. And you're looking for the mayor's signature on Correct. that. Correct. So we need to put that on 13A. Okay, so I look for a motion on that. I'd look, all right, have a motion. Second. Motion by Randy, second by Mike. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Sorry about that, Stan. Number three, application for a temporary location transfer and return of a retail on sale liquor license owned by Zeus Incorporated doing business as Second Street Station as follows. Uh, just so, just a, a heads up, this is for the Cottington County Pro Pheasants. For the period of 4 p.m. February 19th, 2016 to 2 a.m. February 20th, 2016 from 15 Second Street Southwest to 1910 West Kemp Avenue. At this time, I will open the public hearing if there's anyone here who wants to speak in favor of or against this. Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. I'll look for a motion and a second for second discussion. Vote. Motion by Bruce, second. second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Now we've got to transfer this back. So under B, it's for the period after 2.01 a.m., February 20th of 2016 from 1910 West Kemp Avenue to 15 Second Street Southwest. At this time, I will open the public hearing if there's anyone that wants to speak in favor of or against this. Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion. So motion by, who was it down here on the right? Randy, second by Beth. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Number four, second reading of ordinance number 1601, amending section 21.5402, which is in the Gateway Overlay District, of the revised ordinance of the city of Watertown. At this time, I will open the public hearing if there's anyone wants to speak in favor of or against this. Hearing none, I will close the public hearing. I'll look for a motion, a second for discussion. So motion by Mike, second by Bruce. Any questions on this? Mayor, I do have a question. Um, when procedurally, when does this go to this committee? If you look at the procedure as to how a is this in the earlier planning stages? Is this do they still have to submit a a request like they would a variance? How is this handled? Where does it enter the the process? Yeah, this will be early, early on in the process. What happens is that you have a, a company or somebody that comes to you with a conceptual plan. We will then look at the conceptual plan and see if it's something that fits in the gateway. If it doesn't, then it's gonna have to go down to the, the planning and zoning or the, the variance to get that. And then it would come to the council if it's so needed, but it's be very early in the process. Okay. And, and the intent of this is solely to address the well, I'm going to use the word variance. The variances to the building materials as it's called out in the, which is pretty black and white, pretty. So that's its only purpose. Nothing else would be considered at that point. Nothing else to be considered. Okay. Colors, uh, uh, what type of structure it is, you know, as far as wood or steel, what, can, what we can use. Yeah. That's really the only purpose on it. And, and timing, frankly, you know, if people are in a, a huge hurry and, and you see something very simple, but it, we could take it to the Planning Commission at that time or the zoning variance if it. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number five, first reading of ordinance number 1602, creating a bond fund and levying taxes for the payment of general obligation funds. Shelly, I'll let you explain kind of what's going on on this, if you would. Sure, kind of ties into the, the next agenda item. Um, basically, it is just changing the ordinance to recognize the new 
um, 2016 refunding geo bonds if if that is so what the council chooses to do um, every all the other language mirrors what we did in 2010 the last time we refunded um, the bond fund has already been established um, we already levy taxes at 105 percent of the principal and interest payments so nothing else is changing it just basically says that we're having a 2016 refunding bond Okay, so what I'll do is uh, look for a motion a second for no, discussion. No, it's just first reading. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. That's right. Okay. Pardon me. Did you want to entertain any questions on it, Shelley, if there are any? <laughs> okay. Any questions, guys? Okay. Let's move on then. Number five, resolution number 1609 relating to the general obligation refunding bonds, series 2016, authorizing the issuance and making provisions for their payments. Uh, again, Shelley, if you'll take this. This one we do need action on. Yes. Yep. Um, Doherty contacted the mayor and I a couple weeks ago and um, just let us know where the markets were and what the potential savings to the city were. Um, you guys have been given that. That's um, an estimated savings based on the current market conditions. Currently, the the rates are anywhere from 2.35 to 3.35 on our, on the bonds we have outstanding. Uh, the new rates would be 0.75% um, um, at the highest 1.7%. So it, it decreases them significantly. Um, the the total savings, as you can see down there, is just about $193,000. That equates to a net present value benefit of 5.54%. Um, when we're looking at these, anything over 3% of a net present value savings um, makes it worth the bonding costs. The savings outweighs um, the cost associated with that and can actually uh, cut down how much you overall pay. One of the advantages, um, this is a geo bond, and so property taxes are used, so you, you levy property taxes, it's not sales tax, so just so everybody's aware of that. Um, one advantage of the refunding is the ability to pay this off early. Um, that's why you, all the savings is usually recognized at the tail end of this. And because you have to um, bond, you have to levy your taxes at 105%, there is just over $300,000 sitting in that bond fund in reserves that will be used to pay the last payment. With the decrease in that last payment, by the time this comes up, there should be enough to completely pay that off without having to levy any additional taxes for the 2023 payment of principal and interest. So that is a benefit to the taxpayers of, of having that paid off one year sooner. And, and just as a reminder um, for the um, council members that haven't been through this before, this is just an estimate and until we actually f do our final lock-in of rates, um, we don't know where those are going to end, and it all depends on the market. And just because this gets passed tonight, it doesn't mean that we're actually going to do the refunding. If the markets go up, if our savings isn't, isn't where we want them to be, uh, nothing needs to happen past that. This just allows that to happen. Um, if the markets are still favorable once the 20 days past the publication, and the resolution is effective. So That's correct. And, and one of the interesting things is that uh, they came to us almost a year ago and asked us to do this. And uh, in our discussions, we, we really came to the conclusion that it wasn't the proper time. But uh, now to save $192,000 on a $3 million bond is substantial. So I think it's, it's good timing for us. So uh, I will look for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Glenn, second by Beth. Yeah, are there any other questions you have for Shelley? Shelley, the 192,000 referenced, is that net of our costs? That that's a bottom line to us or is that the cost come from that 192? Um that that is actually um with the costs included in there because the new the new bond rate includes those additional $50,000 of, of cost to refund. So, yes. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will look for council action. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Shelley. That was, uh, that's a good thing for the city of Watertown right there. 
Number seven, consideration of proposal from audio and visual connections for audio equipment and installation at the new wellness facility. Stanton, if you want to uh, help us out on that one. Thank you, Mayor. The new wellness facility has reached the point in its construction where the audio and video equipment is ready to be ordered and installed. Two proposals were received, and if the council's familiar with the recent upgrades to the council chambers, this equipment isn't required to go through a competitive bid process. However, um, the we did receive two proposals, and the building committee has, has reviewed them, and they're recommending that the council accept the proposal from audio and visual connections in the amount of $107,041, and payment for this equipment will be made from the furnitures, fixtures, and equipment portion of the project budget. Okay, thanks, Dan. So at this time, I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Randy, second by Mike. Any questions anybody has? Here. Where was this compared to the other bid? Price you know, I don't have that right in front of me. I think we, uh, Randy, I, I think that they were within about, I want to say, a thousand or okay. fifteen hundred dollars yeah. difference, yeah. and I. This close. number here um, is less engineering costs that we won't be charged. So that's why this ended up being the better okay. for us because we. Yep had to have engineering mm -hmm. and so that was done by actually audio, yep. uh, audio i just want to make sure that so we're sure. In, yeah. in they the were, same they yeah were very, very they close. were very very close okay thank you it, just for the public it, it's the community center right? we refer to it as the wellness center right we all know that that's the same thing but some of the folks out there might not know that so right okay any other questions hearing none i'll look for council action all those in favor say aye Opposed? Motion carried. Number eight, consideration of lease agreement with Yamaha through Evolution Power Sports for the use of a UTV uh, by the police department. Ryan, did you have anything you want to say on this? It's interesting. I can kind of give you a little update on it. Uh, uh, this is almost free. I believe it's a dollar. They're going to uh, uh, give this machine to the, the police department to use and uh, I think it's just a really nice gesture by the uh, um, by the Evolution Power Sports for this particular unit. I tell you what, before we get, get put you on the spot, then I'll look for a motion and a second for, for any questions. Sure. Motion by Mike, second by Bruce. Are there any questions on this? This is similar to what we do out at, uh, at the landfill with International. They give us a tractor to run out there for actually no cost. We can use this uh, pretty much any place if there's people you know, lost or something, they can do that or, or just about anything. And or just even traffic control during yeah. an event. Do you, just nice. out of curiosity, do we still do the one with the uh, with the motorcycle? Yes. We okay, do. I thought we did, so. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. See if you can get two of them. <laughs> I'll work on that. Okay. One, one in camera. Yeah, 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 one in camera. There you go. All right. Number nine, consideration of the purchase of a bucket truck for the forestry department in the amount of $11,500. Uh, I will be looking for a motion to second, but I, I wanted to uh, let you know that this particular vehicle was a municipal utility vehicle. They traded it off, and they, they uh, were able to discuss it with the company that they bought the new one from, uh, this is what they were given in a, a trade dollar amount, and that company said we could buy that from them. It's a 42-foot reach, I believe, and our... 55. I'm sorry, 55, and we have a 42. Right. Okay, so this one actually will go up about, uh, <laughs> you know, those 13 uh, additional feet. One of the things that we're looking at is, uh, like out to the golf course, we have numerous trees to take down out there that are very high, and we couldn't do it with the 42-footer. This uh, should save us about fifteen to $1,800 per tree when, uh, when Junior's taking them down. So what I'll do is I will uh, look for a motion in a second for discussion purposes. So I got a motion by Dan, second by John. Uh, also, the dollars will either come out of our fund balance or contingency balance, and I think that uh, you need to make that, that decision for us tonight also. Any questions? 
So should we change that motion so that uh, you guys, do you want to use it out of contingency or fund balance? What do you want to do? You okay back there? <laughs> is that a... Is, <laughs> Is that, a, is that a suggestion, Christian? What, what would you like done? Maybe you want to... Come on up here, man. Come on. <laughs> That's usually something I would do. <laughs> I would make, change my motion then to take it out of contingency. Okay. So I have a, a motion that was changed by Dan that the dollars would be taken out of second. contingency, and John will second that. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number, number 10, consideration of bids received for a fairway mower for the golf course. Um, Jay, I need you to come up here and, and kind of talk about this one a little bit. What I'll do is, uh, uh, before Jay gets into a major discussion, let's go ahead and get a motion and a second for discussion, and then you guys decide what direction you want to go on that. Motion by Beth, second by Brad. Okay, Jay, kind of give us an explanation of what's going on here, will you? Well, this um, fairway mower would replace the uh, current uh, 2000 Jake, 2003 Jacobson that has approximately 3,000 hours on it. Uh, the 2003 hasn't run for the last couple of seasons and uh, just need this fairway mower to uh, work on the uh, maintenance of the fairways out at the golf course. Uh, the bids were opened, and uh, this has been approved by the Parks, Rec, and Forestry Board. This was budgeted for Jay, is that correct? Yes, this was budgeted. Well, Jay, you know, one of my questions on it is, is how have we gotten by, if this thing hasn't ran for two or three years, how have we gotten by to date without a mower, and now we need a mower? And then the second question is, 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 is as I'd mentioned to you earlier, there, we, I know we have a, historical problem with a fairly new piece of equipment that has created problems out there. Availability and ability to mow and such. Um, are these are these intertwined? Is the, is the problem really the one that we've already bought and it just doesn't run or it's not dependable? Yeah. Or These aren't actually intertwined. That is another piece of equipment. And to answer the first uh, question, you know, now the two fairway mowers that are on the golf course are just you know, running really, really hard, uh, Todd would say that they would go out probably nine hours a shift uh, on the two mowers and, uh, you know, 18 hours of manpower to get one cycle down on the 27 holes. Jay, I got a question for you. You know, when I took a tour when we were kind of looking at the new construction out there on the greens, you know, they said because of the way that was set up, some of the undulation, I think that's how you say that. Mm-hmm. Undulation. <laughs> they said that the the mowers that we had weren't very conducive to mowing the way that was set up. Would this do a better job? What you're proposing uh, of mowing those types of uh, it, undulations? It, what they were talking about there was right around a lot of the bunkers, and they got a different piece of equipment. This would actually be more for the fairways themselves. Yeah, it's very interesting about every sand traps. Uh, whatever, greens, tees, they all kind of have different equipment yeah. that uh, maintain them. Well, well Jay, I, I, I don't mean to sound uh, like a broken record w with Mike here, but I really think that we need to look at this and say, okay, if we've gotten by for three years without, without replacing that mower, um, my real question is why do we need it replaced this year? I mean, it's $43,000. It's not pocket change. Are we just buying it because we want to get it out there or, or is it do we really absolutely need it and are we going to get rid of one of those others or it's just have one sitting around for a spare then I re we really need an answer on this well you know ideally it will reduce uh, repairs and downtime and uh, also do a better job that probably allow us to do a little more on the course with some of the um, intermediate cuts and that type of thing. Right now, Todd basically goes from a fairway cut to a rough cut, and a lot of courses will have kind of an intermediate cut, and this would allow him to do more of those types of uh, actions at the golf course. But th this more isn't broken by any stretch. It just requires maintenance from time to time? or, or your The one we're replacing yeah. basically is basically for scrap parts. And, but, but the thing is, Bruce, that mower has been gone for three years. Yeah. 
So it's like, okay, well, what have we done for the last three years? That's my question. Well, it was, pro it was probably needed over the three years, but they figured out a way to do it. But if we're going to maintain the course, like you said, on the different cuts and cut down on the hours, uh, it, it's probably going to be needed. Because one thing about, you know, all the equipment at the golf course, uh, it does run very high RPM, and uh, so there is some wear and tear on it. Well, there is, but I see your guys that are, are, are driving out there and mowing every ball diamond and every field out there They're every day. It's, it's running eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. It's not like, like those are any different than what we're using out there, I don't think. Well, they're different equipment, but I mean, they still have probably the same engine and, and things. So I, I don't know. Uh, can do it this is a decision you guys got to make. You can do it with current staff, though. You're not going to come back and say, well, you know what, now we need somebody to run it. No, I'm, I'm sure we'll do it with current staff. Jay, the, this was approved for the 2016 budget. If, if we don't uh, accept it now or move forward with it, is that going to change what? You, how you need to operate this summer, or? Well, you know, like I say, it would probably just, uh, with the some of the intermediate cuts and that type of thing, it would uh, reduce some of the flexibility that we would have on the course. Yeah, can I go back to that, Jacobson? That, yeah. That, it's, that's kind of long been a thorn in my side, um, and I think it has everybody's. But is that not a fairway more? I was thinking it was a greens mower. It isn't this mower. I'd have to ask Todd to be certain. Yeah, I could have swore it was a fairway mower because this last summer we had periods where we just weren't getting the fairways done and we had sent it back. I think it's a fairway mower. And if we're having problems with that thing, it might be a, it, it might be aside from this issue, but that thing's been a disaster ever since we've had it. That's my understanding as well. And it's, yes. it's never been dependable. And we go out and spend thirty-five, forty-five, fifty thousand dollars for a piece of equipment, and it is a lemon, and has been a lemon from day one. And it just—I don't know what the process is, but I know that if it that were mine, somebody would have a tractor somewhere that they don't want it, um, and you know, in their garage is what I mean. And, <laughs> and but I mean, it, that's it's big dollar items, and yes, I is. and I know that comes back probably to, to Stanton and our staff as to what, what can or do we do with those things. But, um, you know, I certainly hate, if they're related, which I believe they are, I hate sitting here going out here and saying that we're going to get another mower because we spent one, uh, bought one three or four years ago and it just doesn't work right, and that's a big part of our problem. Um, but maybe you should look and find out for sure which mower it is, and if it's the one that, that you're talking about that's uh, a, a real lemon, Maybe that's the type of mower we should get. Is that what you're saying rather than a fairway mower? Well, what I'm saying is what I believe that it is a fairway mower, and, but I don't know. Let me ask you a question. Could this decision be put off until the next council meeting? I think this no, is already passed up uh, one time. 30 days on the bid. Oh, it is. You'd have, to, you'd have to go out for new bids. It would, they'd have to be rejected. And I guess I guess it's a question you guys uh, uh, just need to answer in your vote here. That uh, I still go back to you know we haven't had one for three years and we're just trying to replace one that's broke down out there. Do we really truly need it? And well, I think uh, I would I would look for a better answer in that. The question so, I have is how to get this far. It was already in the we already budgeted for it, correct? Mm -hmm. and made it through the budget we process, right? The two that are currently being used are a 2008 Jacobson and a 2012 Toro. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead. Uh, we have a motion and a, and a uh, second on the floor. I'll look for council action. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. All right. So you got a new mower. Thank you. Uh, number 11, consideration of bids received for an automatic real grinder for the golf course. If you want to uh, give us a little discussion on that. Yes, originally we went out for bid for the real grinders. We received three bids. Uh, Arcs and Rec Board gave a recommendation to award the bid to MTI Distributing. But since then, some other um, issues have come up, so we would request that these bids will be 
rejected with the intent not to rebid as a budget authority may well be reallocated for another purpose. Okay, so I would look for a motion on this uh, to reject all bids, asking for the authority to reallocate the money uh, for this particular project. And, and, and again, it was approved by the Park and Rec Board, so Correct. I would entertain that motion. Motion by Bruce, second by Beth. Any questions on this? I do have one question. Is is uh, even though we're going to reject this, why did we accept the highest bid of the three? Basically, because of it had a brain. The others had manual settings and operation. This one had computer settings and operations, and that is what was called for in the specs. And actually, on the on the one bid from Midwest Turf and Irrigation. We had looked at that bid, and the number that we were looking at did have the brain, but when we looked at it a little further, this one did not. So the Davis equipment bid should have been thrown out basically altogether, so. Right. Because it didn't meet specs. Okay, that makes yeah. sense then. Yeah. Any other questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Mayor, Mayor, before Thank we go you. to the next one, can I just back up one step? Uh, onto the previous one. Jay, the $1,500 trade-in on that, is that the old one that's sitting that hasn't been used? Yeah. Okay. All right. The 2003. That's what I was asking earlier when Jay and I had the conversation. I said, well, gosh, should we, we, should we uh, give that to another golf course nearby in a small city or something? And, and I think your comment was is that you couldn't get parts for it. You can't get parts. And, right. and you also told me that they tried to get... Um, aftermarket parts on it, you couldn't find those either, if I was not mistaken. And some or of the ones that right. were found didn't fit exactly perfectly, so you got to shim them up, and then things bend, and kind of makes a mess out of it. I think the way Rob can use a welder back there, he could probably use that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Hey, Jay, can I ask a question for you? Sure. I got a question for you. This real grinder, do, do they have one of these at the, the country club now? No. What, is that something we would consider co-oping with, with those folks maybe if, in the future? We actually do sharpen some of their blades and then they, they pay us back for the sharpening. Okay, yeah. let's move on to number 12. Authorization for the engineering department to advertise for bids on the following projects. And Shane, if you want to do that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, engineering staff has been actively working on a number of projects and we're at that point in our design work where we're ready to ask for approval to bid those projects. And they include the Uptown Alley Reconstruction Project, the Cook Complex Extension Parking Lot, our annual seal coat and mill and overlay project. And another project we're adding to that list or that style of work is uh, we're gonna pursue uh, micro sealing or micro surfacing. Um, as a new item that we're going to try. And then uh, the 2016 street improvement project, which includes that 12th Avenue and 15th Street Southeast. Right, and I, and I love the microsurfacing process, you know, to see if that would work. I know that there's other cities that have been using it. And uh, 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 Rob, do you want to kind of explain it? I Come on up here. and not, Do you want to do these as, as a one vote, or do you want... You guys got any questions on any of them? Because we could do them separately if you'd like. It's entirely that's up at, to you guys. That's at your discretion. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and get a motion and a second. For approval of all four. Motion Tell by me. Randy. Second, second by Mike. Now, any questions? And let's ask you about that microservicing. Yeah, the microservicing actually is something that Sioux Falls and some of the surrounding communities have been doing <coughs> since 08. So they've put in... Uh, uh, I guess they've put a lot of dollars towards this, and it's, uh, it sounds like they believe that this is as good or better than chip sealing. It actually holds better when they're blading their streets. The stuff doesn't come up as easy as chip seal does. Um, with these heavy road graders and stuff, they tend to scrape off a lot of the chip seal throughout the winter. So um, we did get some uh, plans and specs from Sioux Falls to kind of base some of our, some of our stuff off of for this season. So... Uh, Shane and the engineering 
Well, one of the nice things, if I'm not mistaken, is where, where you don't use that granite out there, you know, which is just tearing apart your snow plows. You use this. You don't have to use that. Is that correct? It's it, The aggregates mixed in with this uh, material, and it's it's more solid. It's got some type of, I guess, some type of cement mix in it, too, that hardens better. Uh, and it's fast setting. It, it doesn't, uh, it's, you're able to drive on it fairly soon. So um, it's... Uh, it's just a better material that doesn't peel up. After, after this is down, do you have to come back and sweep it up again, or is this? No, nope, this is down. It's done. You can uh, drive on it and no clean up afterwards. So put your striping down and go. But it is a touch more expensive than chip seal. It's uh, I think we figured it roughly around two dollars a square yard. Is that what we? About two and a quarter is the average of the communities um, that are doing it. Uh, we're looking at. We've, we've guesstimated we want to do a 20,000 square yard project as a test run, which is a pretty decent sized project. Uh, we're going to also pick a, a fairly heavily traveled street to see how it holds up under our traffic patterns. Um, so we're working together to pick the best street for that. Yeah. Um, so Wait. we're going we're gonna to put in a, a good test run. Yeah, what but to? wouldn't you, you know, the material costs more and things like that, but would there be a savings because you don't have to go back over it again and pick up the, or was that all factored in? But, I mean, you have to go out twice, right, with the chip ceiling? You have to go back out afterwards? and We do go out afterwards with our, our brooms, and we broom it up, and then we uh, stockpile that at the street department. But that's been part of the discussion, too, is if it's worth reusing that material without washing it. Uh, mm -hmm. We do screen that material when we reuse some of that the following right. season. But, so. I mean, if this stuff doesn't, even though it's more expensive, if it doesn't require more manpower to go out and redo it, maybe it's right. not as expensive as we think it is. Right. There is definitely a savings there because when we go back and broom that stuff up, we'll put two brooms on it and, and generally one to two truck drivers because we're filling trucks that fast with the brooms. So How about uh, how about crack sealing? Does this does this take care of the crack sealing also? You still have to crack seal. Generally, the, the from the sound of it, uh, they Sioux Falls goes ahead and crack seals the streets. They're going to uh, microsurface the, a year prior. So they do that, um, and so there is still crack sealing that has to be done. Is this a process that we hire done, or is this a process what we do? No, nope, we hire it done. And, and is uh, that different than the people we're using today, or is that something that they do? Right. It's, it sounds like it's different companies. I, I don't know if these companies actually do chip sealing, too, or if this is just what they specialize in. But um, some of the communities that have this. I think there's a company out of St. Cloud is probably one of the closest ones. Um, there's some places quite far away. So mobile, mobilization would be one of the bigger expenses, I'm assuming, with that getting them up to Watertown. So. We're going, our goal is to um, coordinate our project with the ones around the Sioux Falls area. So hopefully we would get a little bit of a break on the mobilization cost to kind of incorporate our work at the same time frame as the other cities so we're, we're looking at minim minimizing that of impact on the project as well so this is going to free up our uh, sweepers to be able to hit regular streets more often and just Absolutely. generally keep the regular streets cleaner it will it's you know and like uh, shane was saying this this year the roughly twenty thousand square yards um, it's, it's not a huge area that would take, you know, like weeks to clean up, but we'd probably have, uh, you know, a couple days of cleanup, I suppose, on, on the size of area we're looking at. So, but yeah, it would free up some brooming. Yeah, if we moved it to that's what we do, it would free up a lot absolutely. more. Absolutely, than... yep, absolutely. Probably nothing tougher on your brooms than cleaning that up also. Yeah, yeah, we go through a lot of broom cores yeah. cleaning up, uh, you know, uh, chip seal. So definitely the, the other advantage to this, too, is with this microsurfacing, it's it's not as hard on cutting edges for the blades. So you don't, you know, we'll go through uh, on a day of blading, some of our blades will go through three sets at, at uh, 200 plus dollars a set. So, so well, yeah, I know we, my kids would be able to ride their bike easier on it, yeah, it sounds like. Less skin knees. <laughs> Okay, any other questions for Rob or Shane on any of this? Yeah, 
which alley is that? Which alley project? It's actually in the Block Street uh, west of here. The T we call it the T alley, but or Bar Street, whichever frame of reference you want to use. It's bound by Kemp, Broadway, Maple, and First Avenue. Chan, I, I know original talk was to do some of those, uh, the, like the Compesca lot and some of the other parking lots. Is that included in that? or? Yes, we're going to do that project um, in various schedules so that yep. depending on how the bids come in, we can whittle some of them out of the schedule if they come in too high okay. or so forth. So we're, we're adding flexibility to that. And then also the, the Cook Complex, you know, just so you know, that's a, a joint a joint effort by the county and city, which uh, is a real positive for us. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will look for council action. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number 13, consideration of change order number one to the contract with industrial process technology for the wastewater UV disinfect disinfection improvement project increasing the contract amount by $2,499.26. And Shane, if you want to handle that. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, on the UV disinfection improvement project, um, early on there was a item or an issue that was identified. Um, the Trojan equipment supplier needed a six inch conduit and the plans only called for a four inch conduit. <clears throat> so the $2,000 amount of the change order is to increase all of the size of the conduits that would supply power to the project. And then the second item that was identified in the amount of $499.26 is that they needed to um, put in a second temporary electric panel to keep the equipment running out there while they put in the new permanent panel. So that was just uh, identified as a kind of a logistics type issue that, you know, we needed to keep uh, por a portion of the equipment working while the other portion is down. So that uh, both of those were reviewed by our consulting engineering firm and are recommended for approval. So we're bringing to you this to you for consideration. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion. So motion by Bruce. Bruce? Second by John. Bruce, still got this stupid lip that's kind of bugging me once in a while. So I got a motion by Bruce, second by John. Any, any questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. <laughs> no, thanks. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. You know, I got to tell you, I whistling for the dog, it doesn't work quite right, so she's not listening very well. I'll go buy you the yeah, I got to buy a whistle. All right, number 13A. <laughs> this is the one uh, that, that we added on there for the encroachment. And Stanton, if you want to help us out on that and then how you want the motion to read. Thank you, Mayor. This is a bit of housekeeping and pun intended, but in 1995, a building permit was issued for a, a detached garage in the 1300 block of North Maple. And the owner of that property has recently decided to sell, and a survey has revealed that that garage encroaches 3.5 feet into the alley. The garage has been there for 21 years and has never been a problem for snow removal or traffic, but the buyer and their lender want an assurance that the city isn't going to make them remove it after they close the sale. So I've prepared a permitted encroachment agreement similar to the one the city has used in the past that would allow the garage to remain and be maintained with the understanding that if it's ever rebuilt, the owner would have to apply for a building permit at that time. The buyer, the title company, and the lender are all satisfied that this agreement will allow closing to occur, and I recommend you authorize, to sign, to authorize the mayor to sign the permitted encroachment agreement so it can be recorded and that closing can occur. Okay, so I'm going to look for a motion, a second on this, on, uh, on his motions. I got it by Randy and, and Dan. Any questions on this, you guys? 
Stan, when this came up at the Planning Commission meeting a couple of weeks ago, there was, th there was some concern that it wouldn't pass muster with the lending institution. I mean, apparently that's not the case any longer. Yeah, the, the mayor and me and Shane met with uh, the seller and the, the surveyor as well as the title company and the lender over the past couple days, and I shared with them a copy of the permitted encroachment agreement that's before you tonight, and they they got back to me finally today and said that everybody's reviewed it, underwriting the lenders, and that if the mayor's authorized to sign it, this will this will get the property to sell. Any other questions? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, any old business? I did want to uh, make a couple comments. There was a letter to the editor the other day in the paper, and I just wanted to be clear on some of these points that are put in here. One is people worried about a retaliation by the city council. I would say that's way off base. I don't know how this person used to work on the city council. Maybe back in 97 they had that issue, but not anymore. Uh, it just, it bothers me that you guys put in so much time and so much energy for what you do, and then you get that. So I'm gonna open that up for discussion. Anybody has a comment on, on that letter, you're sure welcome to do it. Well, Mayor, I agree with you. I, uh, I respect anyone's right to an opinion and to express that opinion and and uh, but I think when we express things that either cannot be justified or backed up or, or there are opinions of this nature uh, I think they're so detrimental to our community and um, it, it, the purpose might be intended and it might be the right right intentions but it goes way beyond just a little article in the paper as people read our paper and it gets onto the radio or eventually something gets onto the TV and it's how people view our community from the outside as well as those people from the inside. I, th I think it creates a level of distrust that is unnecessary. So it's just my opinion. I, I really struggled when I read that. I mean, I, I do put a lot of time and effort just as everybody else does that sits behind this counter to do the best what's for the taxpayers of the city of Watertown. Uh, I don't feel that we've ever strong-armed anybody. I don't believe that anybody on this council has ever felt intimidated by anybody. And I did take this as a personal insult. Um, like I say, we all put in a lot of hard time and effort. And I, I think this is definitely by far one of the best councils and mayors that we've had in, in years. I'm proud to, to be able to say that I'm a part of it. I will not let an article like this change my opinion of, of what I think of this city, and I don't think the residents of the city of Watertown should either. And I feel it's an insult to the people that elected us to, to this position as well. Uh, we have a lot of trust in the voters of Watertown, and it's an insult to, uh, to the voters that elected us to this position. I would also like to be clear when, when it talks about uh, ask Almost, ask almost any businessman about who is welcome and who doesn't matter and who they will tell you and any new business bigger than yours or with better city hall connections and the heck with you. What a bunch of BS. I go to every, almost every single ribbon cutting in Watertown. Very, very seldom is it a large company. Very seldom is it a large retail. It's usually a mom and pop starting a business. They're going to try to make a living. And I think that's just a bunch of crap. Uh, and then it talked about South Broadway. It says, guess who wants to close South Broadway? You, the city council. You guys have not seen South Broadway as a city council. As a, as a city council here, you've not seen it. This has gone to the planning commission. It's been in front of you. It's been out in the public. I just think that some things are wrong when they're able to write that kind of stuff. So that's, uh, that's all I got to say about it, unless anybody else wants to say anything else. I do. I just want to say I, I concur with what some of the other folks have talked about. I don't believe that they're – and I can say this. I've been involved with city government for probably 25 years, you know, um, from the Planning Commission to the Board of Adjustments to, to being on the city council. 
I would have to agree, and, and we've had some fine council people before us, certainly we have, but I do agree that this is probably the best group. Uh, I believe we all cooperate with each other. We don't always agree with everything. We, we have our differences, but we get over it, and we all work with the best interests of Watertown at heart. I feel that with every person on this council. And like uh, one of you guys said down there, you're proud to work with everybody here. I am too. I am too. And, you know, when pe people make these allegations um, in public or to the public, then they ought to be able to answer to them in public and back up some of these things, come with some hard evidence and some, um, some, sort, of, some sort of documentation that can reinforce what you're talking about instead of just making jabs and then, uh, then we have to deal with that. Um, you know, we like like I think what Glenn said too. It is an insult to the folks that elected us in our wards. Uh, they put their faith in us to do our jobs, and we do the best we can. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes for a lot of these people's and people and a lot of the, of these uh, committees that we have. And I think it goes on um, many many hours for some of us. It comes and goes, but we 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 put in the time. You know, you can be in this job. You can be a, a council person, and you can. You could come, just come to the meetings and look at your agenda and vote and go home. But nobody on this group does that. Everybody gets involved. Everybody puts in the time. And it, it's tough to take jabs like that when everybody's trying to do the best job they can for this community. But on the other hand of that, before we're done with this, I don't, I don't want this to be detrimental to people being able to feel like they can speak in public. I mean, because it is open government. I just want them to be able to, when, when they, they have the gall to accuse us of intimidating business people or what this is going to do or what that is going to do, just like Bruce said, back it up with something, come to us with some information. Hey, we're all willing to listen. Before you, before you strike us with the hammer, make sure you got some documentation to go along with it. I still want people to feel comfortable Absolutely. that they can voice their opinion. Absolutely. And my door is always open. Everybody knows that. They, they come into the office. Uh, uh, the door is always open for them. All right. Uh, any new business? Well, um, we talked about encroachments. And I know some months ago we talked about the, the property on the north side of the lake that was encroaching on the city's property. Has that been resolved? Do you know? You're talking about the, the property... Um, that's that's over near the uh, Compesca Lodge, I believe. It's over in that area where the, the property owners from. It Sioux would be farther west. I, I, by I Dr. Hansen's area. Correct. The, yep. Whatever. There's a there's a public access, access area yes. there. Yep. Yes. The uh, the property owner uh, uh, is is still aware, and I, my expectation is that this this spring we're going to reach resolution. In the winter time, I think for health issues, they traveled west to Arizona or somewhere west. And through their legal counsel, asked if we could stand down until springtime, but they have every intention of addressing it. But in the winter time, didn't think that it was appropriate, and and so they asked us politely to please give them the benefit of some time. I believe they're either back in Sioux Falls or in South Dakota, and the expectation is that once the frost comes out of the ground, they do intend to address it. They're not they're not ignoring us. Any liaison member reports? Yeah, I'd like to just give an update from the Animal Control Board. Um, earlier this year, we looked at uh, modifying um, amendment, we made an amendment to 3.0109 in regards to what animals could and couldn't be kept within the wa town of, city of Watertown. And I know we all got a stack about this thick of all the different rules that all the different com communities had around South Dakota. So as a group, as a board, we went through and we read every single one of them. We also found out that two communities in the state of South Dakota have listed animals that are no longer, they're all, they're extinct, um, by the way, and that an ard wolf, <laughs> and that an ar ard wolf um, does not exist in this continent. And so we uh, wanted to assure all of you that we, we, we took on that work and went through them piece by piece. And what we came up with was a very good, uh, we also talked to the state uh, veterinarian board and wanted to make sure that we incorporated things that they were looking for in cities as they were redoing their animal control laws. And so we've present, pr produced something that I believe covers 
all the things without listing endangered species or in extinct species <laughs> and added what the state would like. And I'm looking forward to sharing this with Stanton. And when we have it complete, we'll bring it forward for the council to review. But it's a, it's a nice milestone to hit because we were able to, you know, kind of pile through all that information and come up with something that I think is actually progressive. Uh, we are one of the few cities in the state that has already adopted some of the things that the state would like to, us, to see us do. So that's that. Beth, as I understand it, we've got a couple a couple new, uh, very qualified people as part of that board now as well. We do. Uh, we have uh, Dan Miller, who's joined us on the uh, animal control board, which has been a wealth of information. He's the one who's helped us with the Ard Wolf. Um, anyway, and then Chrisma De DeWitt, who is a citizen member um, on the board, and she is uh, extremely knowledgeable, extremely dedicated. She shows up to all the meetings, and I guess this is the most effective group we've had in a long time, and obviously Dr. Reeb and I stay attached at the hip, as we have for the past 12 years, and so <laughs> we're just uh, keeping things done. But it's a, it's a great group, um, probably one of the best we've had, and was clearly reflected in getting this amendment done. So. Okay, and I, I did want to bring out, this really isn't new business. It's kind of, we're going to back up to old business. Just so you know that um, we were supposed to have a meeting last week with the mall owners, um, Hy-Vee, Dakota Bank, and others. Uh, we had the snowstorm, so they weren't able to make it. They've since have hired an attorney to kind of stand in for them here in town so we can have those discussions. We'll be opening up discussions again with Hy-Vee, with uh, uh, Dakota Bank with the RVs, all those uh, uh, people that have an interest in it, and the city of Watertown, and the mall has specifically said that they are willing to uh, put some skin in the game now, is what I understand. So we'll open those discussions and see if there isn't something that we can do. All right? Very good. Any need to go into executive session? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So motion by John, second by Glenn. All in favor say aye. aye.